Hello, hello, and happy marvelous Monday, everybody. I hope that your day is well. Listen, I'm excited to be here, and I'm excited that you are joining me today, 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 and today only. We are having a much needed discussion. Um, it's more of a panel discussion, if you will. Um, but the topic is really centered around housekeeping infestation. So if you have not had an opportunity to check out the description, please do so at this time. I'm Carissa Spann, the landlord and tenant coach. And this is what I do each and every Monday at 7.30 p.m. I do have with me today joining me. Uh, she's no stranger to property management, none other than April Coleman. Um, we are going to talk about habits, housekeeping, infestation, who's responsible, if it's the tenant's responsibility or if it's the landlord's responsibility. If you feel that any of the information that I share today, the information that we are covering is helpful for you, helpful to you, or someone you know, share it with somebody else. This live, or if you're watching replay, let me say thank you so much. It is for landlords and it is also for tenants. My only goal today is to share information that is understandable to impact the rental community as a whole. So if you're tuning in for the first time, please let me know where you're watching from. I love to know where my viewers are tuned in from. I try to give information that's helpful, um, but from one jurisdiction to the next, the laws may be a little different, right? So information that I share, it's pretty much just industry best practice. It is not legal advice, all right? So let me just state that. Um, if you have a question, if you have a comment, go ahead and drop it in the comment section. So please get your questions together. If you have questions on today, I promise you that this conversation is much needed, but we are only, we, we are only going to have this conversation once. OK, um, but I promise you that it will definitely be informative. It will definitely help a lot of landlords as well as a lot of tenants. And so if you're watching on that YouTube channel, go ahead and click that subscribe button, hit that notification bell. That way you will be the first to know when I am live and online. So excuse me for one moment as I bring in my special guest today, none other than April Coleman. Hello, April. Hello, hello. How are you? Oh, I'm great. I'm fantastic on this marvelous <laughs> Monday. How are you, beautiful? I'm doing well. Thank you. Awesome. Listen, I'm excited that you're joining me today. This is a conversation, you know, April, that's near and dear to my heart. And I know that it is a concern for you. Um, but for many of our viewers, they're watching on Facebook. They're watching on YouTube. Um, April, give a brief introduction of who you are, how you ended up here today so that everybody will have a better understanding of why we're having this much needed conversation mm -hmm. today. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. My name is April Coleman, and I am a former student of Professor Spans. I was in her property management class and um, have recently received my provisional certification and am currently completing an internship with her so that I can get my full certification and accreditation in property management. Um, this conversation stemmed from the internship experience. Uh, we had the opportunity to perform over 40 uh, housing inspections last week. It was definitely an eye opener. I mean, just there are so many things that we learned in property management, um, textbook, right? But nothing really can prepare you for some of the real things that you're going to see when you enter into um, the apartment setting, um, when you enter into people's homes, um, and when you have to go through things like inspections. And many times we don't even think about what an inspection entails, what we need to look for. Um, and it just brought to light a number of questions as we were going through these inspections. And so that's kind of how we ended up here today. April, thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you for um, letting people know that, you know what, I think that a lot of people really miss the the um, 
the bigger picture, right? When it comes to property management. And every week I do this live form, this live session, but I can appreciate your heart and your concern for specifically this subject matter and being a professional um, in this industry. Because one of the things that I commonly share is this, if you treat it like a business, it will pay you like a business. If you treat it like a hobby, it will pay you like a hobby. But between treating it like a business and or treating it like a hobby, there is so much that goes into the day-to-day -day practice, the day-to-day -day operation of being a property manager, a housing professional in any capacity in property management. Um, in April, you've indicated that you, um, you had an opportunity to um, assist with housing inspections. Mm -hmm. Let me just say that last week was intense, right? So to do intense. 40 inspections in pretty much four days, that was like unheard of, but we got it done. So um, let me just acknowledge um, some of my viewers who are here. Hello, Mr. Ricks. Thank you so much for tuning in from Chesapeake Beach, Virginia. So happy to have you here. So April, let's get into the discussion. Let's get into the conversation because we had um, we had an eye opening experience last week conducting, you know, um, those inspections. And um, I know that you didn't experience it, but well, I'll save that for a little later to let you know what I walked into. Mm -hmm. All right. So I just want to say thank you so much to all of you who are tuning in. Thank you for showing up week after week. Thank you so much, Lynette. North Carolina, Charlotte, North Carolina is in the building. And thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. Sharing is caring. Guys, if you find this information helpful, please go ahead and share it with someone that they may also hear this information. All right. So today we are talking about how to handle infestation in rental properties. Who's responsible? Is it the landlord's responsibility or is it the tenant's responsibility? So April, I know that you have some questions and I want to, um, let's get into the conversation if you will. So let's go to your first question, April, um, because I thought it was intriguing that you have such a heart for what you do, even in the internship capacity that you're in. All right. And so certainly any questions or comments that you have, go ahead and drop it in the comment section. So, Mr. Ricks, I see your comment. You said is six months too long to wait to inspect your property. That is a great question. Here's one of the things that I recommend. Inspect your property, property at least at least twice a year. But I usually would do it quarterly. So every three months. So, no, six months. Um, it's not too long, but I definitely would not wait any longer than six months. So that's a great question. Thank you so much for that. I know that we're in COVID and a lot of people are concerned about conducting inspections. I will say this, make sure that whoever is conducting the inspection is prepared. Make sure you have your mask on, make sure you have your PPE equipment, make sure, um, your supplies, make sure you have gloves, make sure that if you are out if you're not in an apartment building, maybe it's a it's a rental home or a trailer park, if you will. Um, make sure that you have sanitizer. One of the things that I always have is a bottle of alcohol. Whenever I finish conducting an inspection, I always spray myself down with alcohol because I don't want to take anything home with me, right? No bugs, no bed bugs, no roaches, no spiders or anything. So not that the alcohol kills it, but bugs, they typically don't like alcohol. So, um, so April, let's start with your first question. What's your first question today? Let's talk about that. Okay. Um, let me get the question. One moment. Now, for those of you who don't know, those of you who missed the introduction, April is entering into the, um, the career of property management on a broader level, right? And so one of the things that I love to do for all of my students, for people who are new to the industry, I'll do an internship um, and I don't hold anything back. So April, come on, what, what, let's, let's get into it. Okay. About so my this. first question was, what recourse do landlords have 
when tenants aren't maintaining their units their units or the property if it's if it's not an apartment and when they're causing damage okay great question and so if there is some sort of housekeeping issue um the one thing that i always emphasize first and foremost is for landlords to have a conversation with the tenants do a little education little educating rather um because sometimes and here's what i've Here's what I've come to the understanding of in my 20 plus years of being in property management. Sometimes people will do things for two reasons, either because they don't know or because they don't care. And in a lot of cases, what I've seen, I found out April is that um, what we may consider common sense, like cleaning up, wipe the stove down, wipe the grease off, sweep the floor, clean the dishes out of the sink. For you and I, April, that may be common sense, right? But for some tenants, maybe nobody ever taught them how to clean up. Maybe they never been in a clean home. And unfortunately, that is the sad reality for a lot of tenants. So a lot of people don't know how to keep their property clean. They don't know how to keep the rental home clean. And let's also be honest that sometimes there are many definitions of clean. What may be clean to one person may not be clean to the next. And so the one thing that I always stress and emphasize is this, landlords, please communicate with your tenants. If there's some sort of housekeeping issue, it's not gonna go away by itself, right? Hey, Keith, thank you so much for tuning in, partner. So getting back to your question, April, the recourse, what can landlords do, right? Landlords can communicate with the tenants about the issue. Hopefully it is in writing that tenants cannot violate the lease because of, and primarily because of housekeeping, not keeping a clean house, because let's just say April, you, you know, you were in a lot of rental homes last week, helping to conduct these inspections and from one place to the next, things look very different, right? So some places were clean, some were nasty, some were smelly, some were not so desirable, whereas you could not even walk into the front door, right? So landlords should always communicate with the tenants, letting them know what the violation is and definitely follow up in writing. Documenting everything is gonna be so important in the event that it is a lease violation. Maybe it is in the lease that tenants cannot have any housekeeping issues because it would be a breach of their lease and the landlord could possibly take them to court to enforce the lease. Now, here's the thing, in jurisdictions or situations where it's not in the lease, the one thing that I always tell landlords is this, April, you cannot, as a landlord, you cannot enforce something that is not in writing, okay? If it's not in writing, a landlord can't go to the tenant and say, hey, Mr. And Mrs. Tenant, um, your housekeeping could use some improvement. And by the way, not that we're going to, you know, take you to court or give you a notice to vacate, but it is a violation of your lease. And we certainly want to work with you to resolve this issue right? You can mention it if it's in the lease, but if it's not in the lease, I feel sorry because a lot of landlords don't know this. They don't have a clause or addendums that covers housekeeping. All right. What else you got for me, April? Okay. And, and you kind of answered this, like, what can you do to get them on board with the upkeep? Um, or how can you have them eventually removed if they don't comply and are responsible for continuous damage and infestations? So when we're talking about housekeeping, we're not really, some of the things that we saw, yeah, there were some general housekeeping things that everybody has, you know, their home looked lived in, that's normal, that's natural. But there were some where it was just, you know, I mean, just stuff everywhere stuff piled to the ceilings you know um open food on the floor and all over the place having roaches you know climbing into things which then affected other people so how can you for something that's that drastic you know um 
how could you how can you get them to even be on board without being offensive even um and i understand what you just said about the clause right having it in in the lease but how do you even put something like that in the lease like how would you word housekeeping issues to that magnitude for the lease great question so first and foremost um so for me it's easy for me because i've been doing it for a long time i use at least software that um that allows me to have that pretty much that conversation in writing. So the one thing that I always do is I tell people this, I tell landlords this, think about a quality tenant, right? Think about the best possible tenant ever. What does that person look like? Okay. How do you want them to take care of the property? So they have a visual of the perfect or quality tenant. And then I'll tell them to vision, to visualize what a bad tenant looks like. What is the behavior of bad tenants? What do they do? What are their hobbies? What do they like to do? Do they like to smoke? Do they like to have parties? Do they like to smoke marijuana? Do they like to have a whole bunch of people hanging out in the rental property? And so when they begin to visualize what the wrong tenant looks like, I'll tell them, okay, now write that down. We're going to put that in the lease. Do not smoke do not have guests in the property do not um for instance when it comes to infestation since that's what we're talking about um i have a clause in my lease that talks about infestation it is the tenant's responsibility to report that they have infestation they are to report it within five days of them coming into acknowledgement that they have bed bugs or roaches or whatever the issue is if they fail to communicate that they are responsible for any cost when it comes to extermination, pest control services. And so that's how you begin to look at, okay, what am I going to put in, in the lease? How am, I, how am I going to put it in writing? You think about worst case scenario. What don't you want, right? And you put that in writing. Um, and so for me, a lot of people in here know that my lease package is at least 61 pages long. No exaggeration. But I do that because I cover so much. It's so much to cover from corner to corner, from wall to wall, from door to door, from the ceiling to the floor, all the electrical, the windows, the wiring, the flooring, the carpet, the hardwood floors, the tiles, the garbage disposal, the toilet. I cover everything. And so um, that's the easiest place to start when, when, I, when, when, when you have tenants who recognize that this is a landlord who cares about the property right? They will typically respect the landlord who rule with an iron fist. And not to say that you have to be mean and disrespectful, but when you understand that sometimes people need help, you have that honest conversation with them. Because for me, um, April, I see your comment, Keith. I like that. So for me, April, one of the things that I do is I remind myself that Carissa is not about you. It's not that you're hurting their feelings. You're educating them. Sometimes people will receive it and sometimes people don't because here's the thing. Many adults don't like to be told what to do, but this to have a conversation. So for instance, I'm going to use Keith Childs. He's not a, he's not a tenant. He's a real estate investor. So I'm going to use Keith as if Keith Childs is my tenant. And let's say I go into Keith's house and it's filthy. Keith liked the party. He got all these people hanging out. Now, this is just a hypothetical. This is not the reality of Keith Childs. By the way, he is an author. Keith, drop your, um, your website and the information about your book so people can look you up. All right. So I go into Keith's place. He's renting a four bedroom from me. It's a beachfront property in Chesapeake, Virginia, right? Keith loves to entertain, have wild parties. So I go in and trash this everywhere. Beer bottles are on the floor, Ciroc bottles hanging all off the bathtub. I mean, it's just a mess everywhere, right? So I'll have a conversation like, oh, hey, Keith, I see that you had a really great time. Um, by the way, make sure you get up all them bottles because, you know, if anything, spills over onto the floor that could stay in the floor. We definitely don't want to have to charge you for that. You so you see how I'm having a conversation. It may be it's it, it may be in a soft tone, 
but I'm having a conversation about what's in the lease and what I could actually charge him. And so that's how you have conversations with tenants. Don't go in and be like, oh, you got trash everywhere and we're going to charge you for this. And I promise, I promise that it's easier to catch bees with honey than it is with vinegar. So don't be mean. There's always a respectful way to say it. Now, let's just say you do it the nice way and it just doesn't work out because everybody's just not going to be receptive to receive or to hear that they need to clean up. They can look around and tell that they need to clean up. But then again, like I said, common sense, it's not really so common for everybody. Um, but in situations, April, where people don't receive it, people don't want to hear you tell them what to do in the place that they call home where they pay rent, if they have to pay rent at all. Um, in that situation, the only thing that you can do is just document that um, you had a conversation with Keith Childs today on Monday, September the 13th. You had a conversation with Keith Childs about housekeeping. He was very, um, he was very disrespectful. Um, but then you also want to follow up in writing, send a letter. Hey, Keith, uh, just to follow up from the conversation, please, um, ensure that you are, um, you know, you're following the terms of the lease rental lease agreement. Um, if you have to charge them, you want to let them know, put it in writing that you are going to charge them. Let tenants know what expectations you have of them. I like to do this up front before they sign on the dotted line. We'll go over the rules. We'll go over the regulations. We'll go over the lease and the policy. That way it's clear what they can expect out of me as a landlord and what I'm expecting out of them. So I hope that answers the question, April. I know that was a little long winded. Hello, D. Thank you so much for tuning in. Hey, Lyric. Okay, so Lyric, I see you said you need a copy of the lease. I'm going to share a link. Give me one second. I'm going to put it in the chat box. All right. Uh, give me one second before we go to our next question, April. So, Mr. Ricks, your question is, is it a judgment call on defining what dictates an infestation. Okay, so that's a that's a really great question. So here's the thing. Um, look up your, contact the inspection department in your jurisdiction. Have them to define infestation according to the housing code in that jurisdiction. So in the DC metropolitan area in Washington, DC, what I use, what I do is I use the law i use the housing code in every jurisdiction all right and so in the software that i use to create my lease it pulls up housing codes and laws in every jurisdiction that i have rental property so infestation in dc is two or more mm. that's infestation so if there are two roaches if there are two bad bugs if there are two cockroaches that's infestation okay so that's a really great question. And thank you for that. Mm -hmm. D, I like your comment. You said it's not what you say, but it's how you say it. Absolutely. And, and for mm -hmm. me, I like to be soft. I like to be gentle, you know, because sometimes, like I said, people won't receive you if you're mean and nasty. And April, I promise you, I have had clients, I've managed their property and they were some of the worst people when it comes to talking to tenants how they talk to tenants they were very nasty they were very rude and tenants will not respect you i don't care if you own it if it's been in your family um for ten thousand years i don't care if you bought it as a crack house for a dollar tenants will not respect landlords who don't respect them so it's definitely not what you say but it's obviously how you say it that makes a difference hello Hey, Daphne, that's right. Infestation in D.C. is two or more. Absolutely. Absolutely. OK, so what's the next question, April? So the next question was, in the instance of units that are supplemented by government agencies, is the process any different? And what if tenants do not have the mental capacity to care for themselves? let alone their units, because this was one of the things that um, we we encountered when we were doing our inspections, 
that sometimes it's not just that the person is not being clean or sometimes that, you know, that they just are hoarding. It really is that they just don't have the capacity to take care of themselves and they can't even take care of, um, of their units. Okay, that's a great question. Um, and I see your comment, Martha, I'm coming to you. So when it comes to mental capacity, this is so big, it's so important. Mental health is so undervalued. Mental health is so important um, because sometimes tenants cannot, and although they may have their own rental property, I mean, their own apartment or house, right? Sometimes, April, they can go through a program such as the voucher program, um, formerly known as Section 8 or Rapid Rehousing, or maybe some sort of program through um, behavior health um, organizations. And in those situations where tenants have um, behavior health challenges, I always recommend that landlords reach out to um, behavior health organizations. So for DC, it's going to be the Department of Behavior Health. If you have a tenant who you realize need help, contact the government to see if there's some sort of agency who could assist the tenants. Because in many cases, help is available for tenants who need help. You can't treat them any different. Um, because they're, they're, they're people, they're individual, they're no less of a person because they have some sort of mental health issue, right? But I always try to reach out to um, get tenants help when I see that they need help. Because sometimes people, you never know what a person's uh, story is. You don't really know um, what their history is. I had a tenant who, bless her heart, um, April, Last week, while we were doing the inspections, you had finished for the day. We were done. So my last inspection for the day um, is heartbreaking, but it's something that I want people to prepare for because it could happen, right? My last inspection for the day, I walked into a tenant's home. Now, I'm a certified housing quality standard inspector. I'm used to doing inspections in addition to being a property manager, in addition to being a property manager um, professor and all of that. I walk into this tenant's home. And usually when I walk into her home, there's always a strong smell. There's always a foul odor. I said the very first time I walked into her home, April, I said, oh my God, her place smells like death. And she lived like that. So April, last week, the morning of that inspection, before I went into her place, I reached out to somebody to get her some help because I knew that this person needs help, right? April, I walked in and to my surprise, well, not the smell, the smell was obviously the same, but to my surprise, I walked in expecting for her to say, um, I'm in here come on. Cause she never comes to the door, right? She's just always in the, in, in the rental property. And it was just like, okay, well come in at your own risk. So I went in April and she's laying on the floor and I always, I, let me just also state that I never conduct an inspection by myself. I always have somebody with me. I always have a team, a team member, somebody with me. So we walk in and I'm knocking on the door as I'm going in. Hi, this is Carissa. I'm coming in. So I have the key. The door is already open. I'm knocking just so I don't startle my tenant, right? I go in, she's laying on the floor. And as, I, as, as I'm walking closer, April, I'm like, okay, this is not like her to not respond. So maybe she's sleeping today, right? So as I walk in a little closer um, and the smell was just absolutely horrible. Um, but as I walk a little closer, I'm looking and I didn't see a pulse. She wasn't breathing. And I'm like, hello, hello, this is Carissa. And I'm walking closer. And I stopped at a point and I realized she was dead. She was dead in the apartment. And I was like, oh, Miss Tennant, I was trying to get you some help. You know, and it was a sad situation because she died alone. 
she had no next of kin, no emergency contact on file. And so number one, this is why it's important for landlords to conduct inspections of your rental property. Don't wait once a year, don't do it twice a year. Try to do inspections at least quarterly, every three months. You want to know the condition of the rental property. Now, let's just say April, I never conducted an, ins an inspection, right? And I already told you that her place was always foul. It always, had a, it always had a foul odor. What if I never conducted the inspection, right? And people just walk by and they smelled it because that's just the common smell. And she could have just stayed there who knows how long. So I was, I was really kind of glad that I did walk in and I did find her so that she didn't have to, you know, sit there and the body decay and the, the smell becomes even worse. Um, but that's what happens, right? But when it comes to mental health, please take it seriously. We don't know from, from one tenant to the next, from one person to the next, what somebody is going through. Sometimes they will receive help. And I had tenants April where I reached out to get assistance for tenants through social service um, and they declined. And the thing is, you can't force a person to receive help. That's, that is the brutal honesty. That's the brutal truth. You can't force tenants to get the help that they need. All right, so let's go to a couple more comments in the chat box and then we're gonna come back to the discussion, April. So Martha, you said, you didn't see, I didn't say mice. What if the neighbors moved and you had like one or two and now it's a whole city living here. Listen, I love that question, Martha. That's why we are here. We're talking about infestation. What happens um, is this, when landlords, let me, let me just start with the landlord. When landlords realize that there is some sort of housekeeping issue, it is always a best, the best practice to address it when they first see it, right? Because if like in this situation, if the problem is not corrected, it becomes worse because the problem don't go away on its own. So what do you do if you have a tenant um, or you have a neighbor and their mice, they're coming over to your property where you live at, whether it's a house, apartment, a condo. So one of the things that I would do if, if it was my neighbor and if it's a rental property, such as an apartment building or even a house, I'll reach out to the owner and say, hey, um, we have some issues with mice. We've had an exterminator or whatever you've done, you know, to try to fix the problem yourself. If that's not working, have a conversation with the landlord. Let them know what the concerns are, what the issues are to see if they could get involved to help the tenant. Because it's always good, especially in an apartment building where one apartment is treated. The mice, they just going to go to somebody, somebody else's apartment. They're going to go to the next door neighbor. They're going to go upstairs or downstairs, right? So it's always better when landlords can treat the entire building if the tenants are willing to cooperate and allow that to be done because sometimes people don't want help. Sometimes people just don't want help. But that's a great question. How to handle a situation where the neighbor is nasty. Listen, the one thing I would not recommend is to try to address it with your neighbor because you might offend the neighbor because now they might be embarrassed. And so they use that reverse psychology like, who are you to tell me I got mice and you don't want to go down that road. Don't open up a can of worms. Have a conversation with, if you can, the landlord and allow the landlord to correct or address the situation. But great question. All right, Daphne, I'm coming to your comment. You said, look up housing code in your area to just determine what infestation is. Yep, absolutely. All right, so here is, um, somebody asked for my lease. All right, take a look at that. Use that code. When you go to that website, this is the lease that I use. All right. When you use that lease, it will pull up all of the laws, right? In the jurisdiction that your rental property is in. All right. Please take a look at it. If you need more information, please email me. I will be certain to get you more information. All right. All right. So let's go to some more of the comments in the chat box, April. All right, Daphne, you said adult protective services may be able to inform you of what resources that are available, what organizations you should contact. That's a great, that's a great comment. Thank you for that. Daphne, that, that is so sad. You're absolutely true. Absolutely true. Okay, Martha, um, I see your situation. 
All right. So Lyric, you have the lease, you have the link for the lease. If you have any other questions, please let me know, please email me, please inbox me and I will help you out um, regarding that. Okay, so Martha, and they send pest control once a month, but nothing changes. Okay, so thank you for that. Thank you for your honesty, Martha. Here's the thing. Sometimes your neighbors are not as clean as you are, Martha. So your neighbor's mice might travel to your apartment if you live in an apartment or a house. <clears throat> April, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. So, and sometimes Martha, what happens is when your neighbor's mice, Mickey and Minnie, they come and they want to hang out at your spot. You could, you can do a few things. You could, if you have glue traps from your landlord um, or pest control, put it down. Um, maybe try cleaning up a little bit more because here's the thing, mice, roaches, bugs, they need a place to hang out. They need filth. They need dirt. So just try to keep it as clean as you possibly can, um, which might encourage them to not hang out. But sometimes that's just not possible, especially if you've lived there for an extended period of time. Maybe you have clothes in the closet. If you're anything like me, Martha, I got clothes everywhere. I have clothes in, in my room, in all the closets throughout my home, even in my daughter's room. Right. And it seemed like the bigger space I get, the more stuff I, I buy to fill up the space. Um, so but contact the landlord to see if they could help uh, resolve the issue because once a month, like you said, it's not enough. That's just not enough. Unfortunately, that's not enough. Um, so one of the things that I do, and I'm not OCD, but when I'm in the office, even when I'm at home, one of the things that I do is at least two, three times a week, I'll go, listen, I don't like bugs. I don't like bugs of any kind. I don't like them in my home now. If I'm outside, if I'm in the woods, I'm in their space. I'm okay with bugs, but in my personal space, no. So at least two, three times a week. And um, my daughter could verify this, but I spray the base of all the walls in my home, in the office, right? Because I want the bugs to know. I want the mice to know. Can't live here, right? So try that. Try the base of the walls. Um, not something too strong. One of the things that I like to use is Raid Lemon Scent. Now, I know pest control exterminators, they're going to say don't use it. But if it's a once a month treatment that the landlord is sending out to take care of the problem, that's not going to be enough. So get some Raid Lemon Scent if you can afford it. Um, it's usually like three or four dollars for a can. Spray the base of the walls. Um, not too much, but in every room, especially in the kitchen, especially in the bathroom or any area of the rental property where you are seeing bugs and or mice. Now, the bug spray isn't going to kill the mice, right? But at least it will detect the scent that, okay, there's a chemical in this place. Now, another thing about mice, I've come to realize that a lot of people will get um, a cat to help with mice. And then some people, they'll get a dog. Well, mice are drawn to the scent of dogs. And a lot of people don't know that. So when people put like their dog food down or even just the scent of a dog, mice are attracted to that scent. So um, look at housekeeping, look at maybe what you can do, making sure that um, if there are mice in the kitchen, have the landlord um, or the maintenance person to come in one of the things that I do, if I go into a property, if I'm doing an inspection and I know that it's infested with mice, I'm going to pull the stove away from the wall. I'm going to look behind the stove to see if there are any holes in the base of the wall. I'm going to have it filled. And I'm going to I'm going to have it sealed. All right. Um, and I do that because I want to make sure that we keep the pest out as much as possible. All right. So. Um, April, you have any more questions? I do. Okay. So I, another question of mine was when we talk about tenant rights, we usually think of land, the landlord's responsibility on making sure the property is safe, right? Up to code, well-managed. 
Um, and we also focus on, you know, making sure that tenants aren't unfairly removed or evicted from their apartment. But what about if you're in an apartment building, what about the rights of the other tenants in the building? So just like one of the ladies on this, you know, um, chat said, you know, she has neighbors. What if you live in a unit and the neighbors next to you um, are, are not keeping up the, their property. So you're neat and you're clean, you're cleaning, you're spraying, you're doing all these things. Your landlord is spraying, but because the infestation is so bad in the other unit, now they're, the roaches and different things are traveling into your unit consistently. How, what kind of rights do those tenants have? You know, um, because now it's, it's impeding on their level of comfort. Are they able to get out of their lease um, if the problem doesn't get resolved? Um, you know, what recourse do they have? That's a great question. Um, and so ultimately I would, I would, if I was a neighbor, right? If I was a neighbor and my neighbor next to me was really nasty, had really bad housekeeping, I would first of all say something to the landlord to say, hey, listen, I need to exterminate. Whatever you are doing, it's not working. Um, have a conversation. Um, about increasing pest control. Let them know, listen, if this issue cannot be resolved, I would like to terminate my lease. Now, it doesn't mean that the landlord is going to be in agreement and say, okay, well, you can break your lease. Um, in many cases, the landlord is willing to work with individuals, especially to resolve this issue. Um, but let me just also state, hey, Kim, thank you so much for tuning in, beautiful. Um, we're talking about monthly pest control, Kim, but monthly pest control that does not work. So in a situation, April, where you have a landlord who doesn't make repairs, um, that could be a greater situation. And so it's not what we know is what we can prove. And so if a landlord is not being responsible, is not offering pest control services, and especially if it's offered in the lease, because here's the thing. Remember, April, I said, if it's not in writing, you can't enforce it, right? So some landlords don't have it in the lease that they even offer pest control. So, um, but when that happens, like I said, I would start with the landlord first, start with the owner, let them know that there is an issue that you're not happy about and um, ask them if they could exterminate, if they can treat it. If not, let them know, listen, I'm considering breaking my lease because this is unsanitary. It's not healthy for my family or I. Um, and if worst case scenario, that doesn't work. Now, here's the thing. Tenants can always take landlords to court. A lot of tenants don't know that. So if you have a landlord that's not making repairs and you've, you've documented when you've asked the landlord to make repairs, you've asked the landlord to take care of pest control issues and it has not been done, you can st tenants can still take landlords to court, even in the pandemic in a lot of jurisdictions. So tenants don't recognize they have that right. That is their right. And so tenants do have a right. Neighbors do have a right to live in a home that's decent, safe, and sanitary, as well as peaceful enjoyment. And so if your neighbor is an offense because of really nasty housekeeping, that could be a violation of the lease, especially if that's part of the lease. So look at what's in writing. I would definitely always start there. Okay, so Daphne, I see your comment. Hey, Kim, you said make the problem child responsible for the pest issues. I like that, Kim, but see, here's the thing. If it's not in writing, you can't enforce it. You can't tell somebody, oh, well, you're responsible, Mr. or Mrs. Tenant, for um, these mice, although they had to come from somewhere. They had to come from maybe some nastiness or filthy, whatever, right? But if it's not in writing, Kim, you can't tell the tenant to take care of the issue if it's not in the lease. So you see why I always start with what's in writing. If it's in the lease, you can enforce it. If it's not in the lease, you can't enforce something that doesn't exist. Taj, is it good to continue to live in a property that the landlord has moved in? 
That is a great question. So it just depends on the type of property. So let's say it's a house, right? And the landlord moved in the basement. Um, if it's a situation where the rental property is like separate, like it's two separate rental units, the landlord doesn't have access to your rental space, I would say it should be okay. Um, but now if the landlord moved in and you supposed to be renting the entire space and now they decide to move in, that might be an issue because I can see how that would be uncomfortable. So I don't know the situation. I don't know. Um, and you can inbox me or email me offline if you want. Um, but I don't know the situation, right? So let's, let's say, um, it's a rooming house, right? Because my daughter, she went to college at Virginia state and she decided she didn't want to stay on campus anymore. So she got a job not far from school and she rented a room, right? And so there were other students that attended Virginia state and they all had a room in the house. Well, the landlord, the owner moved into the house to keep an eye on what everybody was doing. And so in that situation, my daughter couldn't complain because she only rented a room, right? Versus renting the entire house. So it just depends on the setup for me to say yes or no, but that's a great question. Um, Daphne, the link that you put up, uh, Daphne, what is that for? I see that's for New York, but what is it for? Give me some, some, some information on this. Okay. So Kim, you question addendum. What are you talking about? Addendum. Um, I definitely have in my lease, a lot of addendums. Okay. I talk about bed bugs. I talk about roaches. I talk about peaceful enjoyment. I have rules and regulations, which is why my lease package is 61 pages long, right? Because I have a lot. I cover a lot. I thought about, I thought about this. It was well thought out. And this is why I teach landlords how to do it. Right. Um, Kim, explain your question about addendum. Uh, let me come back to you, April. We have any more questions? That was it for me on the questions. Okay. Um, and so in situations where there's infestation, the question is who's responsible? Is it the landlord's responsibility? Is it the tenant's responsibility? It could be both. It just depends on what's in writing. You cannot enforce something that does not exist. If it's not in writing, you can't hold the tenant accountable. If it's not in writing tenants, you can't even hold your landlord accountable, right? And although they are providing a home that's decent, safe, and sanitary, if housekeeping is an issue on your end, the landlord may not be responsible for paying for the cost to make sure that they take care of pest control if you're the cause of the issues. Okay, Kim, for the pest issues and have them sign. Absolutely. Um, Kim, listen, like I said, well, I'm not sure if you heard this, but I have an addendum in my lease package. Okay. It talks about infestation. Tenants are required to notify me within five days of them finding out that they have infestation. Infestation is two or more. Okay. Two or more mice, roaches, bed bugs, whatever. Tenants are responsible to let me know within five days that they have an issue. If they do not notify me and if I have to bring in someone to do heavy pest control. So I'm going to use bed bugs because I see Mr. Rick's comment about addressing the bed bug procedure. If I see that a tenant has bed bugs in April, um, we did have three units. I found out we had three units that we inspected last week three of those units do have bed bugs. All right. So when a tenant fails to notify me that they have bed bugs in their home. So here's the thing. Sometimes people don't know they have bugs. So one of the things that I always do is, and I tell my people this, when you are conducting inspections, a way to tell that there are, there are bed bugs, that there is an infestation of bed bugs in that rental property. The first thing that you do is you look up in the corner of the room and you look around the walls. If you see black spots around the corner in the corner around the, the top of the wall could be a sign that they're, they're bed bugs, right? Bed bug, 
don't look the same as a roach. They're, they're totally two different types of bugs, right? So when it comes to the bed bug uh, procedures, um, and I know that you have a new tenant that just recently moved in, Mr. Ricks, but check out the link that I put in a chat box. Um, check out the link that I use. That's a lease. That's the software that I use to create my lease package, right? Um, but you can definitely have your tenants to sign the bed bug addendum. When they first sign the lease, there should be an addendum that talks about pest control and bugs and how it's handled and what the tenant should do and how they should notify you and the time frame that you give them to notify you. And when they sign it, if they do not adhere to it, you let them know, listen, we're going to come out. We're going to take care of pest control, but we're going to give you, we, we may pay for it. So here's what I'll do. I'll pay for it. Right. So in some areas, pest control treatment for bed bugs can be really expensive. Um, I've seen people pay up to like $3,000 for bed bug treatment, right? But for many of my rental properties, because I typically deal with some of the same companies in, in, in that particular jurisdiction, I'll pay like $350 for a treatment. So I'll pay for it, but I'll let the tenant know that if, the, if it's their responsibility, okay, well, Mr. And Mrs. Tenant, we're going to schedule a bed bug treatment on X date. I'm going to tell them how to prepare whether they can be in the home or if they have to leave the home. Usually they do have to leave. Um, there could be a heat treatment. It could be a chemical treatment. But I'll let them know that for the bed bug treatment, you will have to come out the home. We are going to charge you um, $350. We are willing to set up a payment, um, payment plan for you to repay the money. I am letting them know up front that this is their bill if it's their responsibility. So that's a great question um, about the bed bug procedure. Um, and again, just make sure you have it in writing, make sure that it's clear. Don't be afraid to cover this information. Um, have an honest conversation with your tenants. Now, let me just pause April because we have been primarily talking to the landlords. Let me talk to the tenants because there are some tenants who are watching and they want answers, they want help as well, because some tenants do have landlords who don't do the right thing. They're not taking care of mice. They're not taking care of the roach problem. They're not taking care of the bed bug problem. They're not taking care of the neighbors who are responsible for the nastiness in the entire building, right? And so if you are a tenant and you have a landlord that's not being responsible by offering pest control or exterminating services, you can contact um, the how you should have a housing inspector department in your rental jurisdiction. You can contact them so that they can come out to verify that you have an issue in your rental property. They in turn will contact the landlord. Okay. They're not going to beat the landlord up. They're not going to say, okay, well just automatically stop paying your rent. It doesn't work like that. I know that a lot of people want to stop paying their rent because they have an issue. You still have to pay your rent unless you go to court and the judge tell you not to pay your rent. Um, but contact the inspector's office, um, the housing code inspector office, have them to come out to do an inspection to verify that you have an issue. They will tell the landlord, listen, either get your act together, clean up the stuff, offer pest control services, exterminate, or you could be fined. And in many jurisdictions, landlords are charged um, financially, meaning that they don't go to, they don't go to jail, but they have to pay money when they don't make repairs, when they don't do extermination. So I want tenants to understand that you have rights. All right. Hey, Flo. Um, yes, absolutely. So thank you for tuning in, in the chat box. Let me grab that link again. I posted a link for the lease that I use. There you go, Flo. Um, grab that link and take a look at that. Um, the so that's the software that I use to create my lease package. All right, so please check them out. So, Mr. Ricks, your question is Do they have to discard all of the bedding? Usually, it depends on how bad the place is if it is severely infested 
They may have to get rid of rid of bedding. They may have to get rid of furniture. I had a tenant who the place was so bad. It was so nasty. OK, let me just be really graphic for a minute. When you walk into the place, you walk into a family reunion of bed bugs. They were just chilling out, hanging out like, hey, come on in. You want something to drink? That's how bad it was. This tenant had bed bugs so bad. They were all over the wall, all over the furniture, all on the sofa. So the tenant had to, there was, there was no getting rid of the bed bugs when it's that bad, when it's everywhere. So the tenant did have to get rid of everything. And they were so heartbroken because they couldn't afford to get furniture, right? They couldn't afford to buy a new, a new um, living room set. They had to get rid of not just the bedding, but they had to get rid of the beds in their room, in their kids' room. They had to get rid of a lot of clothing because they were all in the bags inside the closets. It was that bad. I don't even know how the owner allowed it to get that bad. How long it was like that, I have no idea. Um, I helped them get it back in order and I washed my hands of that because it was just too nasty. Um, but definitely have an exterminator, pest control company to come out Take a look at the situation. Usually they'll do a bed bug inspection to confirm that it's bed bugs. All right. And so during that process, they'll tell you or they'll tell your tenants how to prepare what they need to do, just depending on how bad it is. Now, in situations where there are bed bugs heavily infested in the apartment is just infestation beyond nastiness. Right. Sometimes. Um, like I said, they they may have to get rid of everything or maybe they'll get like um, a bed covering to, you know, they can put the mattress inside the bed covering and still keep the mattress. And so sometimes they can save the stuff. And in other cases, they just might have to get rid of it. Unfortunately. Great question. OK, so Martha. Um, yes. Contact me tomorrow, please. Inbox me tomorrow. Okay. Um, question here. What about apartment management companies not providing maintenance services in the apartments, even after emails, after emails, still nothing for months in that I would definitely say contact the, um, if it's in Washington, DC, contact the department of consumer and regulatory affairs. Um, they have an inspections office. You can contact them. They will, likely not come out right now because we're still in the pandemic and a lot of places are doing virtual inspections. Um, but they will follow up. They'll do the inspection. And so once you contact their office, they're going to set a date to conduct the inspection, but they're also going to contact the landlord to see if the landlord has been made aware of the issue. Now, if your landlord is not making repairs, if they're not doing pest control, Get that inspector out there to verify it and document it because it's not what you know, it's what you can prove. That inspections office will let the landlord know everything that they must do. All right. So be diligent and follow up. Um, and like I said, inbox me and I'll help you out as best as I can. All right. Lynette, you said, but they want our rent on time. Listen, I get it. I get it. Lynette, it's a business. They obviously are treating it like a business. They want the money, even if they are not making repairs. And that's the unfortunate part about what I passionately call slum landlords. So y'all know sometimes I talk about tenants from hell, but they're actually slum landlords. All right. It's real. All landlords are not created equally. All right. Um, it's sad, but true. Is that for all states? Are you talking about the lease? What's your question, Lynette? So I can answer that. Hey, Kenyatta, thank you so much for tuning in, big brother. Is that for all states? What are you talking about, Lynette? Are you talking about the lease? Because the lease um, link that I shared, it is applicable. It does cover all states in the United States. And that's why I love that software um, through that company, because they cover every jurisdiction. I have rental property in different areas and different states and different jurisdictions. And so 
for instance, in DC, there's language that I can use that I can't use and maybe PG or for instance, when it comes to, to the security deposit, you have to know. And although this segment is not about security deposit, this is just an example of why I love the lease package that I use because in some jurisdictions you can charge one month or two month versus some areas you can only charge first and last month for the security deposit. But the, um, the lease that I use, the software that I use, it is phenomenal. I love it. I swear by it. That's the only thing that I recommend. Okay. So you're answering your question about contacting if you're sending emails and no response. Listen, absolutely. Find out in your jurisdiction, maybe do a Google search to see if there's um, an inspection, an inspector office who can come out who can maybe if they if they can't come out because of the pandemic and a lot of people, like I said, they're still conducting virtual inspections, maybe see if they'll do one virtually to verify your issues and have that conversation with the landlord um, because landlords are not exempt from making repairs. They want the money. They're not exempt from making repairs. So I do hope that this information was helpful. April, this was so great. Thank you so much. I do appreciate you. I love all the questions that you have. And I hope I answered. Did I answer all your questions, April? You did. Thank you. All right. So for those of you who tuned in late, this is April Coleman. She is phenomenal in property management. And uh, so I just wanted to bring her on today because uh, she's working alongside me. Last week, we knocked out close to 40 housing inspections in four days, April. I couldn't have done it without you. I do appreciate you. I probably could if I just would have been a lot more stressed. <laughs> yeah, it was stressful. It was a lot. But it, it, was, it was a good learning experience. Great opportunity. So thank you for allowing me to be there. Absolutely. Um, so guys, listen, my time is up and I thank you for yours. This is what I do each and every Monday at 7.30 p.m. right here on my Facebook or my YouTube channel. I hope that something that we share today um, help you. Please make sure that you share this information. Share it because sharing is caring. There are so many people who need help and they don't know where to go. They don't know where to get the answers from. And so if I can help somebody to understand their rights, their responsibilities, um, I am absolutely here for that. I am passionate about educating the rental community. So it's not just for landlords, but it's for tenants also. And so even if you show up late, as long as you get the information, that's really what it's about. Um, and so if you have questions, this is what I'm here for. Drop it in your com drop it in the comment section, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube. Um, I hope that you will join me next Wednesday. I'm sorry, next Monday. <laughs> I'm already into the middle of the week. I'm already at hump day and it's just Monday. Um, but again, thank you for joining me. I hope that you'll tune in next Monday right here at 730 um, Eastern Standard Time. And again, I just want to say thank you for joining the discussion today. Um, if this is your first time tuning in, I just want to say welcome. Please make sure that you're no stranger. Please make sure that you're coming back every Monday, 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is what I do. My time is up and I thank you for yours. If you have questions for me, please email me. That is my email address. You can reach me if I'm online or if I am offline. I enjoy making a difference. I do have a landlord coaching program. I work with landlords one-on-one. -on -one. If you are interested in working with me one-on-one, -on -one, go ahead and drop your information in the comment box that you want information about the landlord life, because that's what I'm about. I'm about that landlord life, but I believe in helping um, landlords improve the way that they do business. So again, I thank you Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I'll see you next week. Bye for now.